the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Today on Straight Talk Africa, an analytical reflection on the first ever Russian-African summit held in the Russian resort city of Sochi last week. That discussion is coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali, and today we are discussing the Russia-Africa summit and what it may mean for the continent. During the Russian summit, President Vladimir Putin sought to open a new chapter in relations between Moscow and the African continent. VOA's Paul Ndiho has more. Speaking at an extraordinary first ever Russia-Africa summit in the southern Russian resort of Sochi, Russian President Vladimir Putin said he wanted trade with the continent to double over the next four to five years. He announced that Moscow had written off over $20 billion of African debts. Our country is taking part in an initiative to ease the debt burden on African countries. The total sum of debt written off currently amounts to $20 billion. Trade between Russia and Africa has more than doubled in the past five years to more than $20 billion. And Putin said his government is looking to double this trade. Moscow was a crucial player in Africa in the Soviet era, backing independence movements and training a generation of African leaders. Free South Africa is... Uh what it is today, largely also because of the support that we got from the people of Russia. The first Russia-Africa summit is part of a Kremlin drive to win businesses and restore influence that faded after the 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union. Back then, the Kremlin backed leftist governments and movements across the continent throughout the Cold War. Putin congratulated Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed on winning the Nobel Peace Prize this month, hailing his efforts to make a peace with longtime rival Eritrea and discussed a cooperation in defense, education, and increased trade relations. I would uh, like to thank the government of Russia for always standing alongside Ethiopia when it was uh, forced to defend its independence and sovereignty. We acknowledge Russia as a key partner in our development in the wars in Ethiopia. The president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Felix Kisekedi, said his country is keen to strengthen the relations between the two countries. It's the reason that we are here in Russia because we want to strengthen the relations between our two countries. You spoke about an investment that still needs to increase, and we are takers. We are here to drive Russia's interest in our country. Russia is Africa's largest arms supplier. Currently, Russia has military cooperation agreements with more than 30 African nations and says it wants to help in combating extremism, including exchanging information between their security agencies. Critics of the summit say this is in many ways borrowing from China's playbook. Even though Russia cannot match China's economic might, it is prepared to support African leaders with controversial human rights records in exchange for access or to the continent's riches. In 2014, U.S. President Barack Obama hosted dozens of African leaders in Washington, D.C. to discuss trade, business opportunities, and security issues. 
A 33 billion trade and investment pact was announced to spur African development and support tens of thousands of American jobs. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Joining us here in our Washington studio are two distinguished guests. Temi Ablogba, Program and Research Associate for the Africa Program at the Center of International Policy here in Washington, D.C., and Richmond Danso, a doctoral candidate and teaching associate at the Department of Political Science at Howard University, also here in Washington, D.C. And last but not least, via telephone link up from New York City is Dr. James Jonah, a former United Nations Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, who is retired, but certainly, as you can see, not tired. I have to say that uh, Temi, Richmond, and Dr. Jonah, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank, Thank you. you. You're most, you. You're most welcome. Let me come to you uh, immediately, tell me, what is your immediate reaction to the summit that just ended in Sochi? Yeah, so it was the first ever Africa-Russia um, summit, which is a really big deal, you know. Africa has had summits with the U.S., with the EU, um, with, other, with China. But the fact that this was the first ever one is a really big deal. And the fact that it was attended by over 40 African states as well. So you had heads of states, you had representatives from international businesses and government agencies, both Russian and African. I think the message that this summit was really trying to send is that um, Russia and Africa relations are really being revitalized. Interesting. Richmond, what about your take? Uh, how significant is oh. this summit? Um, I think I'll look at it from two perspectives. One, from the Russian perspective, what do they have us take in this? Like, why will Russia call African leaders to um, Suchi? And from the African perspective, what are we bringing on the table? What are we taking from the table, right? Suchi is a very beautiful resort city. <laughs> I, I That's where I'm, they held the last uh, Winter Olympics. Yeah. And for me, even choosing that city itself is significant because, um, you know, Russia has been frozen out of world politics to a large extent um, by its attack on Ukraine. So with the Winter Olympics, that one was just trying to project a different image of Russia. And if you look at it from that perspective, that's what they're trying to also do with Africa because Africa and Russia relationship post-Cold War era broke. And this is the kind of image they're trying to pro um, project that we are better than the others, we are more friendly, right? So that is um, the broader picture from the Russian perspective. From the African perspective, I'm not sure what our leaders went into because um, it's a Russia-African summit. We have 54 independent African countries attending, right? And if you even consider Western Sahara for political reasons, then 55 countries. So Russia is coming as a country. We are going as country. So what do we get out of it, right? So it's very difficult to look at it from the African perspective, but I know the Russians have got at least a bigger picture in their mind of what they intend to get out of Africa. What about you, uh, Dr. Jonah? Well, Shaka, as you may know, I have been involved with Russian policy for an extended period. I know many of the architects of Russian foreign policy. I was certain that sooner or later, Russia will return to Africa. Uh, Russia has become much more confident than she was at the end of the Cold War. Just imagine today in the most strategic portion of the world, the Middle East, that all the leaders of the Middle East today have to go to Moscow or to wherever the premier is to consult with Putin. So I, I just do not believe, given the extreme expert in foreign policy, 
that they would leave uh, Africa alone. A few years ago, I was at a conference in South Africa on BRICS, and I met a colleague from Russia. I said, when are you coming back to Africa? He said, right now, we are going to use BRIC to watch Africa from South Africa. We can then determine what we can do. So I say this is a resurgence of, uh, of uh, a more confident Russia. So I'm not surprised. I see. Uh, tell me, is this uh, perhaps uh, one way of Russia attempting to reincarnate uh, what used to be a superpower by the name of the Soviet Union, which yeah. of course collapsed back in 1991. Yeah, 100%, especially on the African continent. They used to have, back in the Cold War, Russia used to have a lot more influence, and then that declined in the 90s once um, the Soviet Union collapsed. So this is definitely their attempt to revitalize that and to bring that back. Now, Richmond, you know as well as I do that uh, when you are, for example, playing the game of basketball, you always refer to the home court advantage. So when you look at uh, such a summit and uh, you're looking at uh, Russia meeting African rulers uh, or African leaders, what do you see here? Who has the advantage? Well, obviously it's Russia. Right, and because um, although Africa have got the resources and everything that the world needs, um, one way or the other, we feel to realize this, right? And I guess it's only African leaders who feel to realize that the potentials we have, and others do realize that. So, in that bit, they call us to their countries. And the moment you get to either um, DC, um, New Delhi, or Moscow, or um, Sushi, wh wherever it is, the home advantage as we talk about it comes in because now they are going to set the rules of the game. And Russia is a big um, country, no matter how you look at it. So just let's put this in context. Imagine Russia um, having negotiations with a country like Djibouti, right, on any issues, security or defense-wise, right? It cannot match up to it, right? Because of one, the home advantage, because of how even Djibouti is, it's, it's a small country, right? But because Africa is not united and African leaders are not going there as a united front, we always go there in divisions, right? So it gives any other country that wants to um, negotiate with Africa, they call it African summit, but to the best of my knowledge, it's individual summit because Ghana goes there to negotiate on its own behalf. So does Nigeria and Kenya, right? So it, it just doesn't play out well to Africa, no matter how you look at it. Whether it's even being held in Cairo, right? The fact that this country go there individually, right from the word go, Africa loses out. What about that, uh, Dr. Jonah? Well, uh, as I said, if you look at the geopolitical implications of what's happening, it tells you what the future holds. Look at China, look at United States, look at France. You see, they are all concentrating on the area of the Gulf and the Horn of Africa. In Djibouti, you have Chinese bases, American bases, French bases all coexisting. You see China focusing on infrastructural development, mostly in East Africa. That's where the new battlefront would be. And I just couldn't see Russia standing back. But let us be sense this. Russia is going to be very cautious. They have had disappointment. Take Somalia. You know, there was at one time when Russia had a major base in Somalia. Then they lost it and the Americans took over. There was one time where they have a very strong military impact in Ethiopia. So I think that they will move very, very, very cautiously, but they want to be part of the great game. So I personally am not surprised that these moves are being made at this time.
But when we look at uh, the summit, what is at stake here? Because it seems to me when I look at uh, the figures, it is money which is going to be made trading with Africa. And most of the resources for that matter happen to be in Africa and not Russia. So why should the custodians of African resources go to Moscow in such a summit? Why not the other way around, someone says, Russia coming to meet the African custodians of resources, for example, in its diplomatic de facto capture over the Sababa? Coming to me? I was saying that uh, what is at stake here, really? Isn't it the resources in Africa? But, well, uh, there are two things which I think we have to take into account. I heard also that Russia is thinking of some infrastructural development in Africa, particularly a road link from the Gulf on to West Africa, or we're going up to Cairo. That's one thing. The railway. Eh? The railway. Yes. Yes. Then there is the question, which is a, going to be very controversial, of nuclear reactor policy of Russia in Africa. That is going to be very exclusive if it develops. I think, I really believe they are playing a long game. Because they cannot cope with, with China at this stage. China, China has played a very clever game. It is very easy to push them aside. And they are looking at the long game. That is my view of what Russia is doing now. When you look at uh, the investments, you look at the Chinese investments, for example, uh, in Africa so far, uh, you are basically talking about uh, 204 billion U.S. dollars of investments. And when you look at uh, the European Union investments, you're also looking at uh, in the neighborhood of 337 billion dollars. Russia is talking about uh, 20 billion and perhaps 30 or 40 billion. Where is Africa here? What does Africa get? I mean, Africa gets AK-47, yes. A lot of African liberation movements uh, benefited enormously from both the political and military support of what was then the Soviet Union. But what is it there, really, for Africa in the immediate foreseeable future? Ask me? Yes. Okay, look. I really believe, Shaka, that one of the best things donors can do for Africa is to develop infrastructural means. Mm -hmm. Africa is way behind because in terms of infrastructure, we are way, way, way back way, way, way back. And until we are able to develop good infrastructure in, in all areas, we can't move. That's what China has been doing in East Africa. I know there's been criticism about the debt trap, but you just imagine the Mombasa to Kenya now going further in East Africa, that's where they're concentrating. If you have Africans moving fast, you know, a few years ago, you may recall that when Mrs. Clinton was foreign secretary of state, she made a very important speech in Nairobi. She said that if Africans could develop their internal trade, I think it was about 5%, then Africans do not need any foreign aid from anybody. And the reason which has returned internal trade is because we have infrastructural deficit in Africa till today. So if China and Russia and others can do that, then good. 
300 years of colonialism did not give us good infrastructure in the continent. Very interesting. Uh, tell me infrastructure. I think that is a very important point. But what about the fact that uh, we have our own people, our own engineers, our own experts. We have universities which have been training engineers for many, many years. And yet, when we want to build a road, for example, we look somewhere else. What about that? When is Africa going to regain its confidence, its dignity about doing things for itself? Yeah, I think this is a really major issue, and not just looking at Russia specifically, but also China with like the Belt and Road Initiative, for example. Mm. A lot of times these other countries are flying people in rather than empowering the actual Africans in those countries and giving them jobs and things like that. Right. But an argument that Russia was actually trying to make through this summit is that they're trying to have a mutually beneficial you know, relationship for African nations, and they're trying to kind of call out the um, U.S. and other Western countries who traditionally they haven't really done that. So this is a point, the point you're making is something that you know, Russia has actually tried to play on um, in this whole soft power exercise that they're going about. You know, I once had uh, the privilege of being a guest of an African president at his state house in East Africa. And uh, we were talking about uh, development and investments. And he said, I am no longer going to give contracts to Euro-Americans to come here and explore our wealth and what have you. Instead, I am going to give those contracts, those opportunities to Chinese. Then I said, but what about your own people? Your own people can develop the ability to explore those types of opportunities that you are talking about. How come, when it comes to development, we do not trust ourselves to be able to do it? But when it comes to the military and what have you, we think we can do it. But when it comes to road engineering and what have you, despite the fact that we have factories of engineering, we outsource. Why? I think it's a historical problem that we've become dependent on outsourcing. Um, and I think the solution to that is really changing the narrative of this. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, in terms of the Russia summit, a lot of Africans kind of look at, to Russia as a positive alternate to, you know, China or the U.S. Um, in terms of China, you know, Africans are realizing they're way too dependent on the Chinese. You see the um, levels of debt and all these things, the amount of Chinese in, in all these countries. So they realize we have an over-dependence on this country. And then in terms of the U.S., they've cited the fact that, you know, U.S. policies in the Middle East have actually been, you know, detrimental to some countries. So mm -hmm. once again, they're looking for another alternate. Richmond. You belong to a different generation, different from mine, different from Dr. James Jonah. Do you feel confident that uh, your generation can, in fact, stand on our shoulders and see a little bit further in the context of developing Africa? I have um, a lot of confidence in my generation. Um, a lot of Africans are doing very well individually. But I think the issue is when it comes to governance and collectively what we can do together, right? But on an individual basis, African youth are doing brilliantly well. Um, you can check from the um, records on almost any major event that takes place in the world, there should be an African individual part of it. So individually, we are doing well. But collectively, um, I think that's where the issue of governance comes in and what your generation is failing to realize that you are failing us even at this time of the um, year, right? So. Um, previous generation failed us, people are also building on the same failure. So it just makes it very difficult for us to have the belief that after you are, you are gone, how much more will it be left for us to continue from, right? If you are selling almost everything on the continent to um, Chinese, to um, Russia, to the United States, what are we going to build on, right? That is a major concern for the next generation, right? What are they leaving up to us, right? What are we going to work on? Because in the next 30 years, most of these negotiations and contracts you are entering in, that's when we are going to have the effects of it, right? If you're unable to pay the debt to China, 
right? What happens? Are they going to take over the countries? The burden is going to be on my generation and my children. So I think, um, to put it simply, we have that belief, but we also are very skeptical of what you people are doing to us, the older generation, and that you are selling our future without you thinking about what's going to happen next, because probably you're not going to be around, so who cares? I mean, that's how we feel. You know, there are some people who say that uh, if only for a second you could imagine Africa as an incredibly gorgeous woman, and uh, this incredibly gorgeous woman of Africa is being courted by incredibly uh, well-off, sophisticated, uh, you know, rich bachelors, which means this incredible gorgeous woman has an opportunity to make some choices, really, mm -hmm. to choose among those incredible, sophisticated, uh, rich, aware of bachelors who are courting her. So what sort of suggestion or advice would you give to the individuals who happen to be right now the custodians of the African continent's wealth? Right, and you pick the right where custodians, right? It's not their property, right? So if you even look at the concept of land in Africa, it's for the dead, the living, and the unborn, mm -hmm. right? So if um, our leaders or the custodians look at development or anything relating to Africa from that perspective, that would be great because then they're not going to just be as well, selfish or greedy and just sign on to any dots that's presented to them, right? They're going to take um, measures and read contracts and understand what is being said, what is a long-term effect, not the short-term effect, not what we're going to get, not what your personal bank account is going to look in the next two days, right? But what is the future for Uganda? What is the future for Malawi in the next 10 years? Are we still going to go to Moscow, Beijing, to Berg, or New Delhi? Or the next stop is going to be Sydney? Like, what are we thinking about? What is the future for Africans, right? So if they can look at these things from that perspective, like this, we are just custodians of um, these resources, right? And to pick on your analogy with a beautiful woman, right? My grandmother used to talk about this similar thing, but what she would keep telling us is that if you are that beauty without brains, then you're not going to get anywhere. So that answers the African question, right? Very pretty, but we have the brains as it's where, the resources. To manage it, I'm not saying we are not smart, are we applying that in terms of leadership? Probably not, because if the continent is still at this stage, then we are missing that, right? So that beautiful lady will just be misused by men, and in the long run, she's just going to look ugly, right? And that is what is happening to Africa, and that's what we have to address. Are you surprised about uh, talk about uh, when it comes to leadership? Uh, people talk about... Uh, when it comes to Africa, that there is, in their words, not mine, a leadership deficit. <laughs> we don't have, um, I'm sorry to say, but a lot of the um, so-called leaders on the continent are not leaders, right? Because leaders look after, uh, up to, um, after the um, citizens, right? But look, if you look at what happens on the continent, that's not what they are doing. These are people who are there to enrich themselves. So I don't even think we even have the leaders to start with. And yet power is, for all intents and purposes, it's supposed to be used as a force for good. Not with African leaders. For improving the quality of your people's conditions, mm -hmm. your people's lives. Let me come to you, uh, Dr. Jonah. You've been around. You've seen it, you've done it. What is your observation? Why is it that uh, Africa isn't perhaps where it is expected by many to be, especially given that uh, it seems at least to have had uh, an incredibly good start by some of the founding fathers in the early 60s? Well, uh First of all, our founding fathers were unique. And uh, I 
Okay, call when I was doing the orals for my masters. And this was uh, around 59. Mm -hmm. And there was tremendous fear in the West that Africa would become communist. And they asked me the question, what kind of role will you play as an African? I said to them, look, I don't think you understand Africa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, Africans do appreciate what assistance they will get from Russia and the communist camp, as it called, in the fight against imperialism and colonialism. But they will find difficulties in Africa for two reasons. Africans are religious people. There is no way they are going to denounce God. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're not going to do it. Secondly, they are not going to have an embrace of uh, 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 socialism in terms of controlling the means of uh, uh, production is not going to happen because there is something innate in the Africans of trading. And they were surprised at this. I said, uh, and of course, this is what happened. I think our leaders understood this. They are not going to accept all ideology as it is. The next issue which they confronted, of course they were not there, they were all removed. We forget that, that our leaders were removed shortly after they took over and military regimes were installed. And there are a lot of historical writings now as to how these people were installed as military leaders. You yourself can know how did Idi Amin become president. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> the facts are there. Okay. So that that was a problem. What about Mobutu Sese Seko Wazabanga? Well, 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 this is, look, if you want to go into it, if you want to go into it, the Congo crisis of 1960-64 was the pivotal struggle between East and West. Because how it ended decided who should be at sway, and the West won. But the problem is that the West won because Sako was with them, Katavubu was with them, the man who was with Russia, Lumumba, was killed. This this what happened. So the West, and, the West won and the Congolese people lost. Yes. That's that's what that is what happened. I mean <laughs> this is why I grew what I grew up on. And uh, that was unfortunate uh, uh, for Africa. But if I can go back to our young colleague, mm -hmm. and he's right that the new young generation of Africans are, are in a better position. You see, the way when we went to school, and I must say, to be very frank, that uh, uh, I know for the British they did give uh, good for the mental education, but, but for some reason or another, they did not allow Africans to get into the field of engineering and things like that. You have to be a lawyer, you have to be uh, <laughs> a doctor, a clergyman, a teacher. These are the preferred professions. We don't build a nation on those. Okay, now things are, are changing. So when you get to mining, I come from Sierra Leone, you have the mining, but you have nobody 
Now they are doing it at the time I was growing up, who has any mining degree. So you have to bring in outsiders to do that. So these, are, these were all of the, 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 com, the complications. And even I was told by a Russian in the Luma University that they found so many Africans were going for the humanities and not for the tough engineering degrees, you know. So these were things which held us back, and hopefully it might change. I'm afraid uh, time is not our best ally. You are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment, so please don't go away because we'll be right back with you. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about, sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and Hadiza Kiari, and Ayan Bior, and Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them, today, not tomorrow. So let's connect, let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward, to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. Now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. Speaking at an extraordinary first ever Russia-Africa summit in the southern Russian resort of Sochi, Russian President Vladimir Putin said he wanted trade with the continent to double over the next four to five years. He announced that Moscow had written off over $20 billion of African debts. And today we are talking about uh, the Africa-Russia summit. Our guests are Temi Abilogba, research associate for the Africa program at the Center for International Policy, Richmond Danso, teaching associate at the Department of Political Science at Howard University here in Washington, D.C., and uh, via telephone link up from New York, we are joined by Dr. James Jonah, former United Nations Under Secretary General for Political Affairs. I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. You're most welcome. <laughs> Let me come to you, um, Temi. There is a, a very interesting uh, gentleman in New York and his name is Professor Joseph Stiglitz. He is uh, a Nobel laureate uh, in economics. He teaches at uh, Columbia University. He's a former chief economist of the World Bank. He has written several books, among them, the one on globalization. In that book, he talks about uh, how, for example, the intellectual balance of power has been shifting in the favor of Africa. And he's right. When I was growing up, there were very, very few universities that you could count on the African continent. There are so many universities today. There are so many university graduates, very smart. There are even, in fact, Africans who have, in their own right, uh, become world-class experts. Africans can now read a paragraph and understand it and interpret it the way they want. Any particular reason why that does not seem to have really made significant 
difference in terms of the ordinary people, the ordinary African people benefiting from that change. Yeah, so I think that's an issue that really has to do with good governance and leadership issues. So a lot of the power and the money in Africa remains at the top percent, one percent. And that's because of things like loyalties, um, tribalism, um, people wanting to keep the money in their own families as well. Um, so instead of allowing the, the financial gain to trickle down to the ordinary people, um, it just really remains at the top. What about you? Uh Richmond? Yeah, I think I agree with her um, to a large extent what she's saying, but I also feel like um, the educational structure of Africa, I mean, it tends to be more uh, from what the colonialists left us. Like we are still focused on grammar, um, not a lot of um, skills and entrepreneurship, right? So in Ghana, we have what we call the free HSS, right, which is a um, good idea to give all high schoolers free education. But with me, my um, issue with it is, most Ghanaians go free into, education. Yeah, for um, high school. Are those, uh, for example, by any chance called uh, universal, uh, like secondary education or universal primary education? So, um, high schools in Ghana are supposed to be free now. Um, mm. It was part of the um, current government's policy. Do they have <coughs> the infrastructure? That that is um, one issue. So that is so now they have to um, run this double track system where students go. Um, for three months, then they come home and stay for three months, and before they go. Do right. the elite, for example, the ministers, mm -hmm. the ambassadors, the judges, do, and the rich people, do they in fact send their children to those schools that you are talking about, or do they actually send them somewhere else? Um, it's um, interesting because um, in Ghana, most of our high schools. Um, are very good at um, government high schools. Mm. So during my time, at least when I was in Ghana, almost most of majority of the people will send their kids to these um, top schools, which are government funded, right? But there are also other institutions being run by um, that follows American and British curriculum. So I mean, depending on who you talk to and what the person wants, but to a large extent, most Ghanaians send their uh, school um, kids to public institutions. But the point I was trying to make with um, your question is. Um, with this um, free education, trying to give everybody universal free education, what we are missing is we are still charming our individuals who are very grammar inclined, right? So we come out and we cannot produce anything, right? So if not for political reasons, I suggest that this should have been free education for people who wanted to have technical and vocational skills because that is what the country needs and that is what brings about development. But do you still have the type of education uh, which is characterized as one size fits all. Pretty much, right? So pretty much, um, you learn, you're supposed to learn English, um, yeah, you learn French, you learn all the colonial um, things that were left behind. We are still holding on straight to it, right? And we are not trying to empower ourselves in areas of entrepreneurship, which is very crucial for any country development, and that um, goes to the point um, the gentleman on the phone was making, right? Africans are lacking behind when it comes to these areas, and it's of our governments to focus on that. They are not doing that. They are still focusing on the old way, the old way of doing things. So we need a paradigm shift, at least in that perspective from an educational point of view. Very interesting. If, in fact, uh, uh, your leaders, by, by the way, if they were watching you right now, say, like, uh, your president, Nana Akufuado, if he was watching this program, what is it that uh, you would say to him in order to help make the country better than he found it? I think um, Nana has got a very good opportunity. Ghana has discovered oil. Um, we have blessed so many resources, right? He should make sure that these things are utilized to the benefit of Ghanaians, not to the benefit of his party members. Right? There's so many allegations of corruption in the country, and that is not helping. Right? That is why the previous government lost. So if he's really committed to empowering Ghanaians, then these resources should be used to benefit Ghanaians. And to his flagship program, which is the free high school education, I think he needs to take a second look at it, probably tell, be honest with Ghanaians that, Hey, this was my flagship program, 
But looking at it from this perspective, I think we'd be better off focusing more on vocational and skills training than the part you are going on. Or a combination of both. Better still. What about people who say that, uh, yes, while it is true that uh, you need to focus more on some of these uh, skill sets that can actually immediately bring food on the table, that perhaps what actually is lacking in most of Africa is the role of what is called as social engineers, organizing society. That you have to be able to have a sort of foundation, infrastructure, so that the other, which is a superstructure, can fit in. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think when you look at the civil society spaces in a lot of African countries, they're shrieking because of, once again, bad leadership. But you have activists who are coming out and saying, fighting back against this. I know I always talk about Omoyele Shorore because I'm really passionate about his case. Mm. But he was a president in the 2019 elections. And he was really trying to argue that you know, for years, or for decades even, since military rule and onwards, um, Nigeria has really been plagued by bad leaders who don't, who haven't allowed, you know, the nation to move past a lot of its issues. The ogres. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so instead you have these people who have all this power and then everybody at the bottom, there's nothing for them. So, you know, building a better civil society space, a better social space is something that very much needs to happen. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's look at what's on top for next week's program. On the next Strait of Africa, conflict in Cameroon between the government and the English-speaking regions has caused deaths and displacement of half a million people. We'll explore how a peaceful resolution can be achieved on the next Strait of Africa. Welcome back. And before the break, of course, we were talking about uh, the need for social engineers. So how do we go about doing that? Because at the end of the day, unless society is governed well, it's not going to deliver a lot of things that are needed really by the vast majority of the people. Yeah, I think an education shift, so instilling those types of values into young people so that they can grow up and think that is really necessary because I think we mentioned this earlier in the show, a lot of the issues that this current generation um, who are in power, mm. they're kind of passing down those issues um, and not you know, creating a space for the younger generation to come up in. So I think by, you know, empowering the younger generation and teaching them, hey, this is a different way to look at things, I think that's a really, um, a really good way of making sure that, you know, the future could be, you know, potentially different for Africa. What about uh, uh, the uh, requirements for leadership? You hear in a lot of African countries talking about uh, the equivalent of a high school diploma uh, in order for you to run for such and such an office or the equivalent of an advanced uh, higher school higher school certificate or university degree to be a governor to be a member of parliament and what have you but there are two important things that you don't hear about one is character the other is integrity yeah why um, I think that's not something that we've valued as a continent overall. Um, we look towards power and status a lot more than those things. And I think that people look to being, look at being a civil servant as a fast way to get rich. You know, civil servants are millionaires and billionaires in a lot of countries, which makes absolutely no sense at all. It's meant to be an act of service. You're meant to be trying to help you know, the smallest person in society, the person with the least, you're meant to be helping, you know, lift them up. So, like I said before, I think there needs to be an overall shift in the way we just view things in Africa. What about, uh, uh, what about the issue, uh, Richemondo, of uh, basically what somebody would call uh, the type of leader that really is there to serve his or her people, servant leadership. Where is servant leadership when we need it? Because you see 
the issue of individualism as uh, raised by uh, Temi. Uh, in fact, uh, there are people who uh, characterize that type of people as people who are patriotic to their stomachs, the stomachs of their families and their friends, not society, not country. I think um, it's tough, um, especially um, judging from the fact that we've had this um, not so caring leaders, for lack of a better word, uh, for generations on the continent, right? So it's just difficult. We are always looking back and see, oh, we had the likes of uh, Seriti Kama from Botswana, who, um, to a large extent, um, facing this boss of being a seventh leader. Lieutenant General? In the first Kama. In yeah. fact, uh, he once told me in an interview in Havarone, a very nice man, that uh, his names were Serese Kama and Ian Kama. Serete, of course, uh, being his dad, mm -hmm. the founding president so of the, uh, the nation state of Botswana. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just so hard now, but we can't lose hope. We have to forge forward. And, we, and I also think that it's up to the um, youth of the continent <coughs> because now we are exposed. There's so many information out there. We know what is wrong with the continent. We know what has caused it. At least there are case studies for us to see within ourselves, among countries, between countries. This is what other countries have done, and this is how they've done it, and this is how, what they've achieved. So if we truly care about the continent and we want to move the continent to a different level, then it's, it, it, it demands on us to um, put selfish interest as, um, be behind us and um, forge forward. And I must admit, this is going to be pretty tough because now the world system has even changed. So you have China. You have um, Russia coming, you have India, and all these are trying to get things from Africa. And one way they try to do that is to induce these leaders with um, gifts or through acts of corruption. Right? So it's going to be tough for whoever tries to take that mantle, but it needs to be done. And individuals, um, African individuals and youth need to take up this mantle and do it. We have to, we can't feel the next generation. Mm -hmm. We can't be having the same story over and over again. So somebody has to do it, and the youth at this point needs to pick up and do it. What about uh, someone once said that uh, basically all of life is about uh, passion, action, and reaction, and uh, that to ignore, for any generation to ignore the action and passion and reaction of their generation is perhaps to risk having not really lived at all, occupying space. Is it quite possible when you look at it that uh, the vast majority of our African brethren, sisters and what have you, are in effect occupying space, or our African rulers are occupying space? Yeah, I think so, because when you look back historically on the continent, you have people like Patrice Lumumba and just other leaders who their legacies still hold on today because of how passionate they are. And because of that passion, like you said, they put things into action and actually got things done. And we can still see the effects of their work today. But as of the leaders now, you can't really name many who you know what they're passionate about. You know, you have the Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed. Oh, yeah. He's a great example. Oh, yeah. And that's part of why he won the Nobel Peace Prize, because could, he has that passion. He could very well be the legitimate new bleed of exactly. African leaders, exactly. really. Exactly. Exactly, and I really hope that other, you know, incoming young leaders look to him as an example because I think if they are to have that kind of way of thinking, then we could see a nice shift on, on the continent. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's interesting because talking about people just occupying space, right? You have leaders on the continent who have been there for decades, right? And they still keep talking about the same issue. We are trying to develop the countries. We are trying to um, give pipe on water, electricity. But you people have been there for centuries. So what have you been doing yes. if you are not just occupying space? And the irony is that with the emergence of democracy and some of them being forced out, they try to play around the constitution. It's hap now happening in Guinea, right, where the president is trying to seek a third term. Right? It happened in Burundi. It happened in um, Uganda. right? Um, Congo, Kinshasa, one way or the other, they managed to solve it. But as they say in my country, 
he left the scene, but he's pulling the string from behind, right? So the whole idea of being so selfish and not caring about the people, being out of touch with realities, right? That is what is killing us, and that is what is killing the continent. And it's just so depressing when you see these people occupying the spaces and not doing anything about it, yet they don't want to leave. I mean, if you are doing the job, <clears throat> that's okay. I don't care how old you are, if you are, doing, if you are delivering. But if you've been there for six, um, 30 years, 27 years, and you still talk about trying to unite the country, as in Cameroon, what are you uniting? You've divided the country over. Leave the scene. It's very interesting because, in fact, uh, that is supposed to be our next topic, the Cameroon. Now, what about, uh, in my particular case, for example, I have lived uh, for at least... Uh, uh, so at least six decades, at least. And throughout that time, I was hearing elders and leaders talking about how, for example, Africa does not produce what it consumes, does not consume what it produces. And someone who happened to be one of those examples of uh, the Bill Clinton administration's, uh, you know, beacons of hope for African democracy. Another word was, uh, another phrase actually was, uh, uh, the new bleed of African leaders. Came about, in fact, and said, uh, that is very simple. All you need is simply to add value. This particular gentleman, uh, who I will honor his dignity and not name his name, has actually been in power the last time I checked for 33 good years. Should we listen to this man really when he keeps telling us that uh, it's very simple, you have to add value? How come he has not really been able to succeed in simply adding value. I think he's adding value to his or her life, mm -hmm. probably, really? by staying in office, right? Because if you've been there for over three decades and you're still talking about adding values and you've not been able to achieve it, uh, come on, what, what else do you need? Richmond, can you do me a favor? If you were to look in your camera, I don't know whether your camera is number three or, one. yeah, number two. If one, you, were, one. you were to look in, your camera. Could you address those type of leaders directly? What is it that they really need to do? If they can no longer add value, can't they, for example, figure out how to manage their own exit? Because if they don't manage their exits, unfortunately, someone is going to have to do it uh, for them and not in their interests, really. Right. Um, to the African leaders who are still holding on to power, I think um, a good example is what happened to Robert Mugabe, right? He had phenomenal years governing Zimbabwe, and he outstayed his um, power. So obviously, he was ousted out, right? That shouldn't happen to you, right? You've been in power for over decades. No human, good human rights, no constitutional right, and you're still talking about adding value to the country. We, the youth of the continent, have realized that you've added, you've added enough value to your life. Well, unfortunately, time is not our best ally, and right. on that note, our distinguished guests were Temi Ablogba, Richmond Danso, and James Jonah, thanks to our audience for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not bitter Africa, and please remember to keep the African hopes alive.